Hey everybody! On this episode of the podcast, we have an amazing, amazing. We're gonna we're gonna turn over the apple carts on this one, Rosie. There's gonna be some people that are not gonna be happy, but you know what? Jesus made a lot of people unhappy too because he told them the truth, and that's what happens when the truth comes out. Sometimes it makes people unhappy, right? Yeah, you're like <laughs> super excited. <laughs> well, we're, this episode. Well, I'll, yes. What do you know, man? Oh, hey, did I you just, know yeah. that there is uh, any... So there's a guy yeah. in the government. They call him the beer bottle dictator. <laughs> and there's one man that has to approve every beer label design in the United States. Okay. It, wait, that's the guy. His name's Kent Battle Martin. Kent Battle Martin. And he has to approve every beer bottle label design. Yes, he approves beer bottles and labels for the Tax and Trade Bureau, a section of the Treasury Department. Wow, that's weird. That's a cool job. So it says, this year, which was, I don't know, because I have a copy of this, (laughs) he single-handedly approved over 29,500 beer labels. (laughs) Do you wonder if he ever just gets tired and he's just like... They said yes. Everyone yes. says they don't like him. Oh, he's so very he's, he's not very nice. So he is a, it is a battle. Yeah. Interesting. So he is tensely and formally dressed on all occasions with an encyclopedic memory of beer labels. Wow. <laughs> he takes his job seriously. Yes. <laughs> I would take it that he's not drinking the free samples that they I send with know. the thing. Okay. All yeah. right. Well, that's uh, that's a that's a good. Did you know? Yeah. So there's, there's one guy. Yeah. There's always, you know, remember the soup Nazi from Seinfeld back in the day? Yeah. No soup for you. Except <laughs> this guy. No beer bottle. No beer for you. No, yeah. no, no beer bottle label for you. No beer bottle. Label. Yeah. I can't uh, say it. Anyways, dude, we have a great episode. Yes. We are going to we are, we have a, a guest on, and her name is Marsha, and we're going to introduce her in just a second. And uh, wait, did we do the? Uh, Wait, we gotta do the uh Yes. The baby update. All right, quick. So, since this is a long episode. Okay. Go for Twenty-six it. weeks. Yes. Babies as big as an acorn squash, fourteen inches, approximately two pounds. Uh it says babies getting eyelashes. Sweet. Uh fingernails. Got it. And it can swallow Amy amniotic fluid all right i didn't know they could do that neither did i but I and guess the baby's it... eyes open brain wave activities going uh so it can hear noises we went over that a couple weeks ago yeah now that can respond to them that's so cool yep she's our little what what's her size do we do we have a, a fruit uh, or a vegetable I'm our baby yes I said an acorn squash. Acorn squash. She's 14 inches, two pounds. Our little acorn squash. She's she's growing so fast. It is growing. She fast. is she it. is growing. Wonder if the sonogram was wrong. <laughs> it can happen, right? <laughs> it does happen. Uh, all right, man. Yeah, and uh, women are getting gassy. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the this. side effects. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So let's talk about the episode. <laughs> All right. So we have a woman by the name of Marsha, and she is uh, just a, a wonderful uh, gift to the church, if you ask me. She has a ministry that uh, is th- through the occult and New Age and all these other things, but she has done extensive research on the one and only Enneagram. The Enneagram is catching on wildfire on the church today. And it is causing um, uh, people to just go nuts over. What's your number? What's your number? There's literally Instagram accounts that are specifically designed to different numbers, and you can read about them and all that stuff. But you shouldn't read about them because they're evil. (laughs) Well, some people may not know that, and that's why we're here to expose the origins and the truth of the Enneagram. And that's what it's going to be about on this episode today. So get a cup of coffee and... Relax, because you're about to get yourself educated on the Enneagram. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're listening to the All Out War Podcast.
Well, everybody, it's such a pleasure for this podcast. We have uh, a wonderful guest. Her name is Marsha. She was an ex-astrologer. She has been uh, reviewed on USA Today. She's been interviewed on the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. She's been on Janet Parshall's America. She has a wonderful ministry and a website called ChristianAnswersForTheNewAge.org. It's ChristianAnswersForTheNewAge.org. You can find her there. We'll put all those links in our liner notes as well. But we are going to have an awesome discussion about this raging, uh, just this awesome, (laughs) crazy on fire in the church personality test called the Enneagram. And Marsha has done amazing research. And I'm going to just, I want to introduce Marsha. Marsha, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on, Turner and Rosie. I really appreciate it. (laughs) Well, it's our Our pleasure. (laughs) It's our pleasure. Yeah. So I uh, came across your your information because I had noticed that the Enneagram was literally taking uh, like wildfire through the church. And I had a sneaking suspicion that it wasn't everything that everyone thought it was. And when I came across the research that you had done, I was blown away. And so that was the catalyst for me reaching out to you to have you on our podcast, because I think that there are a lot of Christians that listen to this podcast and they may be uh, being exposed to the Enneagram, and it would be helpful for them to know sort of the origins and what dangers it could present. And... <laughs> We're just going to buzz. We like buzz killing stuff. <laughs> we, we do. We do buzz kill a lot on this on this podcast. I think, and I should probably preface this, if you are into the Enneagram right now and you're a Christian, uh, we in no means bring this out as any type of judgment. This is nothing like that. It's simply... This is the revelation of the truth concerning this particular personality test. And you do with it what what your conscience tells you to do with it. But you should stop doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but you should stop, yeah. I'll, <laughs> right. I'll say it. <laughs> I'll be blunt. <laughs> so why don't, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and then jump into the Enneagram and let's go at it. Okay. Okay, Sure. Uh, Yes, well, as you mentioned, I I was once an astrologer. Um, I was involved in the New Age for about 20 years. I I was involved with Eastern religion. Um, I got interested in some Hindu beliefs, and I went from there to Tibetan Buddhism uh, for about a year or so. And then I got into Zen Buddhism, and Mm. I stayed in that for many years. I learned to do, you know, the meditation um, but I was also, you know, I also had other new age ideas. I wasn't like a, just a, like a Zen Buddhist or, to, or anything like maybe what you would find a Zen Buddhist in Japan or anything. You know, I was a new ager that so incorporated different ideas together. And I had, you know, I believed in using tarot cards. I learned some numerology. <clears throat> I had spirit guides which everybody who, everybody who's a psychic, an astrologer, a medium, um, you know, any, anyone who does this thing seriously has spirit guides. Mm -hmm. And I I just want to mention, because I have found often when I'm talking about this, that people sometimes have a misunderstanding of this. They, um, sometimes if you're driving down the highway or something, you'll see a sign off to the side and it'll say, you know, psychic and it'll be you know lit up in lights and then it'll say you know your love and future told or something like that <laughs> or madam rosa will will tell you you know tell you what you need to how many kids about you're your gonna love have. Life or something. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that that kind of thing now that that's one you know those the people who do that and i'm not trying to say this in any kind of way of putting them down because they're doing what they that's what they know. I mean, it's, it's wrong in God's eyes, but you know, these are Christians, they're, um, they're, a lot of them are scam artists <laughs> and you're always reading about these psychics who are scamming people and they say, bring me all your gold and I'll, you know, there's a curse on you and I'll remove the curse. And I'll, well, those are just, those are just con artist games. Mm-hmm. They're not really psychics. And most of these people with these signs that you see are not really, um, 
you know, astrologers or psychics either. They're just good at reading people. Right. And mm-hmm. they're good at sizing you up and kind of guessing or making good educated guesses on what your problems are. And most people have the same kind of problems. When right. women go, it's usually a relationship issue. You know, with men, it might be money or or. or or their job. I'm not trying to be stereotype here, but that tends to be the category. So there's that classification of people. Then there's the people who do these things who are really invested in it spiritually and mentally and psychologically. In other words, it's part of their life. It's part of their belief system. Um, they, they truly believe in what they're doing. They are into the spiritual side of it very deeply. So they tend to hold a lot of, um, kind of new age belief systems, uh, or some kind of, uh, something related to that. And they do this in a spiritual sense. They see it as a spiritual activity. It's very different from the other people who are doing it just for money. Hmm. So I just wanted to make that clear. So people don't confuse the two because I've had people, actually asked me if I, how I felt about, you know, cheating people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, well, how did you, how could you, how could you con all these people? And I'm like, the first time I was asked that, I was a pretty new Christian. I was like so shocked I could hardly speak. And I was like, I wasn't trying to con anybody. I, and they were like, you believed in it? And I said, yes, of course I believed in it. I wouldn't do something I didn't believe in. I mean, yeah, I'm not a con artist. So anyway, I, you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings. So I just want to straighten that out there. So I'm not justifying any of it and I'm not justifying or defending what I did, but what I did, I was sincere in it and I did believe in it and I wasn't trying to deceive people and I didn't make a lot of money. So you weren't, so, you weren't, know, weren't Miss Cleo. <laughs> And that's the way it is for most, you know, all my friends were like that too. And all the people I knew who did these things and I knew psychics, I knew mediums. Of course, I knew a lot of astrologers mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, they were all, kind, they were all the same. They were all like me. We were all kind of spiritually invested in it. And it was like our spiritual path. And we thought we were helping people. Mm-hmm. So I want to make that real clear right up front. So now I spent a little time on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want people to know where I'm coming from, you know, so I was in it seriously and I never for, never wanted to leave it. I didn't want to become a Christian. And God intervened in my life. Hmm. Basically, he just intervened. And, you know, and he broke down barriers in me that finally led me to trust in in Christ. But, I mean, this was over a period of about, I'd say, you know, maybe eight eight or nine months. Hmm. And I do have my story on my website. So if you go to my website, then you can read the story. Because it's really, there's a lot of, parts to it and it's hard to sum up except to say what I did (laughs) but I did trust in Christ and eventually you know I a lot of different things happened that led to me going into full-time ministry so I actually operate as a missionary people are wondering and I've been doing it for 21 years full-time under a mission board and I'm supported by my church and several other churches and by um, individuals give who give to me monthly. So I've been doing that full time for 21 years. Now my ministry of course deals with the new age, the new age and the occult, because those are the areas God took me out of. And those are the areas that I know well. And it's also those areas that I see mainstreaming in the culture. Mm -hmm. So um, I have been tracking different things as we see them in the culture. And, uh, you know, some of them are in the health field, like Reiki, which is energy healing. And now some hospitals are even offering it. And other things have been mindfulness, which is actually a Buddhist form of meditation. And I saw that coming into the culture and getting very popular. And I have four articles on that on my website. And I uh, did a number of posts on it on on, uh, Facebook, at least 100, I would say, starting in 2011. And so I kind of track things or, or maybe new age bestsellers and things like that. So back in 2011, um, I, well, I knew about the Enneagram, uh, when I was in the new age because it caught on in the new age in the 1980s. Hmm. And I remember, you know, I, I heard about it and knew about it, but I wasn't 
interested in it. I think probably because I was an astrologer and astrology goes into the personality and astrology, you know, is supposedly this really in-depth, profound picture of, of you and your life, why you're here and, you know, everything. It's supposed to show everything. It's very complex. And uh, so I probably, you know, I saw other things as being more shallow. (laughs) So I wasn't, you know, I was like, you know, like, oh, you know, well, nothing can be as good as astrology. I'm not going to waste my time on anything else. So I didn't, (laughs) I didn't, you know, I didn't look into it or find out about it or anything. So then I started hearing about it in the, in the 90s. um, I got a request for information on it via my church from some missionaries overseas. Uh, I think they were in Austria Hmm. and I guess they were coming across it and they wanted information on it. And I happened, and I don't remember how I got this, but I happened to have a brochure that this Catholic woman had written about the Enneagram, giving the history of it and all the problems with it. And I don't know, like I say, I don't know why I had it, but I, I, you know, I had read it and I wrote something up, kind of a summary of the, of the issues. And my church sent that to the missionary. And then, uh, I didn't really think that much of it. I knew that it was, I knew some Catholics were, were offering it like at retreat centers. It was not officially ever officially condoned by the Catholic church, but it got into the church via some Jesuits, uh, or actually one Jesuit who studied with this man I'm going to talk about later, Claudio Naranjo. Mm -hmm. And so it went into the Catholic Church and into the New Age about the same time. Hmm. It was like two different tracks. And um, so I I I knew it was there, and I knew, okay, there were these Catholic retreat centers doing it. Uh, I didn't think it was good, but that wasn't my area, you know. I mean, I'm not Catholic, so I I didn't have any venue for speaking to the Catholic Church about it. Uh, and I wasn't really thinking of it. I was, you know, focused on other things going on. Uh, and then I, I, I somehow came across the information that it was being presented at some Christian conferences, but these were progressive conferences with people, the kind of people that would go to these or the speakers would be people like Rob Bell and Brian McLaren, mm. who had been part of what uh, was once known as the emerging church movement. Yep. Uh, and for those who don't know, that started in the nineties um, and went on into 2000 uh, for a while. Uh, it was uh, supposedly the idea was to reach an, an unchurched generation and they would do church differently and, uh, you know, try to appeal to younger, younger ages. And so and some people did do that. They just, they just, uh, they didn't really change theology, but they have different ways of doing church. Yeah. But then a lot of people who were at the forefront of this movement started altering their theology. Their views started shifting and getting further away from what we would call a conservative evangelical Christian <laughs> worldview. And they started departing from biblical views. They started seeing the Bible as, as this kind of record of how people thought of God rather than being God's word, etc. cetera. So there was this drift from, away from orthodoxy. And it was these people who were doing these conferences. And so I noticed that, and I was, I was concerned enough because it was still under the, the label of Christianity. So I wrote my article in 2011, my first article on the Enneagram called um, the Enneagram GPS, Gnostic Path to the Self. Mm-hmm. And I wrote a little bit about the history and I wrote how it's supposed to be like a roadmap to find your true authentic self. And this is in the sense of kind of the uh, sense, Gnostic sense of the self as being this this kind of pure divine essence and you know of course that's how the new agers were using yeah. it and um i i wrote the article and i thought okay there it is i've laid out all this information if anybody was wondering about it if they you know search they can find my article and I sort of felt like, I guess I thought I had addressed it, and that was, <laughs> that was the end of it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> God, okay, I did my part. <laughs> and um, boy, oh man, was I wrong. Oh my goodness. So, you know, a few more years go by. I don't, I hear of it now and then, still in these more progressive circles. But then a few years ago, I saw that and this book came out. Um, the Sacred Enneagram, and I can't remember which came out first. There was the Sacred Enneagram and the Road Back to You, and they were a year apart. Yeah. Uh, one was 2016, one was 2017. Uh, and I noticed the publishers, that are these publishers that are usually viewed as, you know, not releasing something that was way out there. You know, yeah. Zondervan and IVP, InterVarsity Press. Hmm. And so Zondervan put out the Sacred Enneagram, and I actually, when I first saw the title, I didn't, I didn't know who had published it. I just saw that there was a book called the Sacred Enneagram, and I assumed it was a New Age book from the title, right. because uh, you know, I, I'm, I, it just it sounds like a New Age book. And so I was very surprised when I saw Zondervan had put it out. I didn't know anything about the author at the time, Chris Hurth. I know a lot more now. <laughs> and then uh, The Road Back to You by Ian Cron and Suzanne Stabile. And, of course, I didn't know anything about them. So when I saw those books coming out and they were announcing them and kind of publicizing them, I started looking into them. I started looking into the authors and into what was going on. And then I noticed that Chris Hurt was, was doing this tour uh, to different churches and even some seminaries to teach people about the Enneagram. And I was, I was really taken aback. And I thought, well, surely this is not going to catch on. You know, people are going to hear this <laughs> and they're going to be thinking, well, this is strange. You know, we don't want to do this. I just really assumed that was how people would react, you know? I mean, I thought, well, a few people might get into it, you know? Well, but then the promotions were really heavy. I mean, they did really heavy promotions of these things. And then I started hearing here and there about people getting the book or, or hearing or people would ask me about it and say, what do you know about this? And all of a sudden, and I can't even remember when this happened, but all of a sudden, at least by last year or maybe the year before, it just really, Everywhere. well, one book only came out in 2017. So maybe last year was when I really noticed it coming out and getting, um, catching on. And this year it's been like a wildfire, mm -hmm. you know, it has just, it has moved so fast, uh, so unbelievably fast and so widespread all over the country. Uh, and I keep hearing about it from people on Facebook, and that's one way I know. I mean, I also do Google searches, and I've listened to some pastors talk about it. Two people went to Liberty University in their, in their chapel or their convocation and talked about uh, the uh, Enneagram. And I, my understanding is that attendance, to that is mandatory yeah, at liberty. Is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And so all these people were hearing this, this, this man and woman talk about it. And I listened to the beginning, the beginning of their talk. And I've listened to many talks and many podcasts on it. So, of course, I have been, when I became aware of the, how this was catching on, I started um, doing more Facebook posts on it. And I also added to that one article I wrote in 2011, I added three more. So I have um, I have the Enneagram has no Christian origin, <laughs> and the Enneagram, the, what you should know about the Christian authors, and I have one that's a basic overview article called The Fictions and Facts of the Enneagram, because uh, people just were constantly asking me, um, what is the one article I can send, you know, my sister's in a church and they're going to teach this and she wants to give the pastor something. I, and you have several articles and posts and I don't know what to send. Yeah. You know, they're going to send like 10 things to somebody. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I need to write one article. And then that's what the fictions and facts of the Enneagram is. It's not as detailed. And is the, the, my first article has a lot of information, but it's, it's not really too much to, to give somebody unless they really want to read a lot about it. So I did this basic fact with bullet points, you know, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. So I, I go up to like number 14 and, um, I did that article so people could use that. Uh, I kept coming across more and more information as I researched, I would get more information. And, uh, the very odd thing about this is, is that the Enneagram 
is completely invalid and it's really nothing. <laughs> it's re- there's really nothing to it. Yet it is incredibly complicated. Right. <laughs> it's so complicated. The history of it um, and how different people are using it and the various facets that are related to it. It's so typical of something from the new age to be like this. Right. It's something that's really meaningless, <laughs> but yet it manages to attach to it all these different stories and and lists of supposed facts and tales and myths and I mean it's unbelievable. It's so it's so new age in its essence, the way that this thing has grown and gathered all of these false things about it. And that's why I had to write the Enneagram has no Christian origins because uh, the books, those books I mentioned and other books and all of the teachers and pastors I've listened to, and it's not everyone, you know, so I'm not saying everybody, but everyone I've heard who promotes this has said the same thing. They have said it goes back, they, they either say it goes back to the 4th century Desert Fathers, uh, and then they mention this fourth century monk, Vagrus Ponticus, and they'll say somehow they, they've kind of formed the, uh, they'll either say the Enneagram idea came from them, or they'll even say they used it. Hmm. And, um, or there's also a, a tale that Ramon Lowell, this medieval, um, Catholic who was mm-hmm. in Spain, uh, <laughs> came up with it. <laughs> And so these two things had to be dealt with, and I deal with those in my article. And so that's the first thing people should know, is that, no, there is no absolutely zilch Christian <laughs> Christian origin to this. The Evagris Conicus was not coming up with the Enneagram, and he was listing uh, sins of the flesh or something, <laughs> and he was listing mortal sins. Yeah. Yep. And Ramon Lowell was, uh, drew a lot of charts. He did draw a lot of charts and diagrams. He loved to draw charts and diagrams. I think he was into geometry and mathematical stuff. And he was trying to illustrate, one of the things he was trying to do is illustrate the Trinity. Hmm. So, it, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was it was not in their minds at all to do anything about personality per- person- type. Because right. <laughs> I, a lot of people don't realize this concept of personality is a modern concept. Mm-hmm. This yep. is not an ancient concept. People didn't sit around and wonder what personality traits <laughs> they had in the fourth century. It just, it's not, it's a concept from psychology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yep. psychology wasn't developed till, you know, the late 1800s. So this was, this kind of thinking exists with these people. Uh, mm-hmm. For one thing, but also there's absolutely no historical documents, and even secular historians who have looked into the have said it all started with George Gurdjieff, and George Gurdjieff was um, Armenian Turkish man. He'd been raised Eastern Orthodox. Um, he uh, was born around. I, I've seen different dates. Apparently, his birth date is not clear. I think it's anywhere from 1866. 1872, and um, he, he was raised Eastern Orthodox, but he left that. He he was a spiritual seeker. He wanted to, you know, uh, exist in other beliefs, and he wanted to travel and, and hear other ideas. So he was that kind of person, and he patched together different views that he got from different places. Some sources, I'm not an expert on him, but some sources say he studied the Kabbalah, Mm-hmm. which, you know, I, I can see that, and different things like that. So he's studying these mystical things, and he uh, supposedly, you know, he he had, so he had all these mystical kind of what you would really call in a way, new, although New Age didn't really exist as a movement then, kind of New Age ideas. And he came up with this, uh, he was very fascinated by mathematical laws, and so he came mm-hmm. up with a nine-pointed, diagram, which is an enneagram. Enea comes from the Greek for nine, and gram is like the Greek for a drawing or a chart or it's, it's some, something along those lines. So it's like a diagram of, of nine nine points or nine sides. So it's like a, you know, a gram, it's like pentagram is a five-pointed right, right, thing. Right, yeah. And enneagram, you know, a neogram or a neogon, like a, or a pentagon. I mean, we all know the Pentagon in the United States, which is the 
army headquarters. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's that's because it's a five sided bill. It's shaped like a five sided, you know, thing. Well, this is a nine sided. And he believed because of his ideas of, of, of numbers and everything, that the way that you could figure out these uh relationship of these points to each other. He liked to play around with what he called the law of three and the law of seven. And by, by playing around with these ideas like that and with the musical, he had a certain musical scale he used that he would draw around the Enneagram and he would play with these ideas. And he felt that everything could be fit into the Enneagram. The Enneagram could diagram anything in the universe. Wow. That was, it was kind of his, his explanation for the universe and for all of its meaning and all of its secret laws. And so, I mean, you can see this is a very occult yeah. uh, kind of Gnostic type idea. Yeah. And that, and that's how he was. That was what he was. He was sort of an occultic Gnostic person. And he, you know, that's what it was to him. It had nothing to do with personality, you know, that never, as far as I know from, from what I know about, never crossed his mind. And, and I listened actually not too long ago to a podcast from uh, it was an interview with a man from the Gurji Foundation, the Gurji Foundation, yeah. you know, of people who believe in his ideas. He, I mean, there's still followers of these teachings around. And he was talking and said, yeah, the Enneagram was, you know, just, it didn't have any anything to do with personality. They were kind of laughing about it because they see this as a misuse of what Gurdjieff was trying to do. <laughs> well, of course, you know, it didn't stay that way. Um, his his pupil, now he never wrote anything about it. His, he had a pupil, uh, P.D. Uspensky, who was Russian, and he wrote up the ideas and teachings, allegedly, of Gurdjieff into books. Uh, In Search of the Miraculous was one of the books and supposedly talked about Gurdjieff's ideas of the Enneagram. And still, there was no personality. There was, he did divide the Enneagram into three parts, triads. And according to the teachings of Gurdjieff, these have to do with the way of the fakir, F-A-K-I-R, the way of the monk and the way of the yogi. So these are all, quote unquote, holy men mm-hmm. of different religions. And, um, of course, yogi would be the Hindu and monk would be Christian. I think fakir might be uh, Islam or Sufi. I'm, I, I forgot now. But it's these holy men, and his idea was to put these kind of holy men from these different religions all together in the Enneagram. And they were like, they related to different, these three areas of the Enneagram. But that, so that still had nothing to do with personality. Right. Yet those three areas, which are called the triads, I see over and over again, Christians talking about this. Oh, this is the, you know, the, they'll, they'll say maybe this is the body, mind, and heart, or this is the emotions, the intellect, and the instinct, or the gut. Hmm. And so I think that's coming from the New Agers because that's how they do it. Right. So um, that's where the three things come from. And everyone thinks it has to do with personality. And it, it's actually the secure, the monk, and the yogi. <laughs> that's what it is. So mm-hmm. anyway, uh, I'm sorry I'm laughing because it's not really funny. But, you know, I mean, if you don't laugh about some of this, you'll go nuts. <laughs> right. Uh, at, least I, at least I feel like I'm yeah, going to go the, nuts. So anyway. Yeah, we're the same way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so now we're here with Uspensky, who's written his book. And then at some point, Uspensky, uh, I think, uh, Gertrude died in 1949. I don't think that the Enneagram was known by anybody until 1940. I think that's when Gertrude was starting to teach it. So, I mean, we're looking at not all that long ago, mm-hmm. 1940, not terribly long ago in terms of history. <laughs> uh, then Uspensky, who I think actually died, uh, I think he was younger, but I think he died maybe a year before Gurdjieff. I'm not sure. They died around the same time, I think. Anyway, so he, at some point there, a man named Oscar Ichazo, who was Bolivian, was supposedly working in a cafe. Now, this is a story, and he ran into some followers of Gurdjieff, and he somehow overheard information, and he picked up on the teachings, and somehow he learned 
the teachings of Guruji. I don't know if anybody really knows. Now, here's something people need to know. People like Oscar Ichazo, um, and, and a lot of people like that, even Guruji was like this. They're spiritual, to a certain extent, they're spiritual con men. They're like the gurus. They're, they have this, this knowledge, and they can talk like they really know stuff, but they're also, at the same time, if they're attracting followers, they're good at conning you. Mm-hmm. Because uh, one thing about Gurdjieff is that uh, he supposedly, or his followers said that he learned the Enneagram from the secret Sufi Brotherhood. called mm. I think it's called the Suramnam Brotherhood. And it never existed. Right. There's absolutely zilch you know, evidence for this. There's no historical evidence. Um, and he came up with different stories. And I even heard somebody say, um, or I read it, uh, that every time Gurdjieff was asked, well, where did you learn the Enneagram? I think Guspensky may have said this. He gave a different answer. Hmm. Now, that's very, very typical. What you're dealing with, what you're dealing with here is typical New Age, you know, bluffing. You're not, you're not getting a straight story. You're getting these different tales. I'm not saying everybody in the New Age does this, but I'm saying a lot of the leaders do this. A lot of the people who have influence and, and followers, um, not all of them, but some of them do, a lot, especially people who are starting movements. Mm-hmm. So um, they tend to be very manipulative, and they tend to be good at charming people and getting them to believe them. So... I think Gurdjieff was like that. I think Uspensky was very serious. I don't, I'm not sure about him. I don't, I, I don't get me that impression that he was like that. He was like this very serious guy, took everything very seriously. But then Os- Oscar Chazo was, was quite the character. Um, <laughs> he's really, he's still alive. He was born in 1931. He's still alive. Mm. And he's in Hawaii. He's retired. Uh, so Oscar Chazo somehow picked up the teachings and he started a school in Arica, Chile, and the school is called Arica, A-R-I-C-A, and he started teaching his ideas there, basically a cult. This was uh, a cultic type ideas that he's teaching, you know, ideas. It was, the teachings were all secret. Mm-hmm. People were not allowed to tell anyone what they learned here. Mm. I was contacted by a woman who grew up there. Her mother was a follower of Ichazo. Mm. And she contacted me by private message on Facebook and told me how horrible she, I'd never gotten being able to talk to her again, but she told me one time how awful it was. The teachings were really terrible. She was so glad that she was able to leave. And I don't know when she left or how she left. She was older. She she said this in her words were what Ichazo taught were the black arts. <laughs> wow, that's how she sees it. She said it was truly evil stuff, truly evil. And I, I mean, I believe her. Yeah. Um, she's become a Christian, but I don't. You know, I like I say, I had that one contact from her. Well, it made an impression on me. It made me realize I really need to take this seriously. What's mm-hmm. going on? This enneagram isn't just some kind of fun thing. To right. play around with. So Ichazo came up with uh, what he called the ego fixation. And it seems that he uh, possibly used some of the, the list of sins from Evagoras Ponticus uh, that, that may be, I don't know where he got that from, but he got it from somewhere and kind of used it in his ego fixations. But it wasn't, it wasn't about finding your personality type. The idea was that you learn what ego structures have strangled your true self. Hmm. He taught that you have a pure inner essence, a pure self, but it gets covered up by, by things from society. You know, society has certain expectations or they tell you you're a certain way, things you believe about yourself that aren't true. And all of these constructs, false constructs of who you are, are laid on top of this pure essence. And that's the ego. The ego is the false self. And so you have to work through that to find the pure self. And that was that was his teaching of the Enneagram. Mm. And the, he had a student named Claudio Naranjo. Now, Claudio Naranjo is, also, is a very interesting man. 
very, uh, very, very intelligent. He just died earlier this year, I think in August. Uh, when I was writing my articles, he was still alive. Uh, Claudio Naranjo was a, a Chilean uh, psychiatrist, very learned. He studied a lot of different things. He, he has academic credentials. Um, he lost his only son in an accident in 1970, which sent him to this kind of inner spiritual journey. And he ended up at Rica uh, with Oscar Chazo, and he mm. learned about the Enneagram there. And so he was there for a little while, and then he left. And the Ronho goes to a place in Big Sur, California called Esalen. Now, I don't know how old yep. you guys are. <laughs> but Esalen, to anybody, probably anybody over, I don't know, maybe 45, maybe 50, I'm not sure, would know about this place. This this was, it was, it was infamous. I mean, yeah. it still exists. It doesn't have its infamous reputation anymore, although it's very, still very new age. But at the time, it had all these kind of controversial figures there, these people who were doing psychedelic drugs, yep. uh, Fritz Perls, who was very out there kind of psychologist. They were doing um, all of these, these, they had these transpersonal psychology, all of these, these experimental psychological ideas. And, and it was sort of a think tank and a, a place where people did things too. They did drumming, you know, they did these new age things. <laughs> it was really a hotbed of new age, edgy, humanistic psychological culture. Yeah. It was really something else. I mean, it, it was wild. It was wild. And everybody at that time who was around then and old enough to know knew about it. Hmm. Well, Claudio Naranjo was there and he actually worked his way up the ladder. I don't know what his official position was, but he was there and he started teaching the Enneagram there. Hmm. And one of his students was Bob Oaks, O-C-H-S, who was a Jesuit. Now, why the, why he was there, I don't know, but he was there. Uh, I think there's some stories about why he was there, but he learned it. And actually, he's the only person that Claudio Naranjo gave permission to, to teach it. Hmm. He didn't give permission to anybody else. So, so uh, Bob Oaks goes back to this uh, Catholic seminary in, I think, Loyola mm -hmm. in uh, Chicago and starts teaching it to some of the priests or the students there who were going to become priests. One of them was Richard War, and I'm going to get to him, but I, I want to mention him now. That's where he learned it. Uh, and also, so that way, it kind of started creeping into certain areas of the Catholic Church, like yeah, the retreat right. centers. It now, was never officially officially condoned. Now, Marcia, can I cut you, cut you off for just a second? Um, sure. You, you mentioned Claudio Naranjo. Nar yes. And... Uh, yeah, and we're talking about the origins of the enneagram and and just the truth of where it came from and who who incepted it and all of those type of things. I have an, right. an audio clip I want to play of him in an interview. Okay, and this will help. And I and I want you to explain what he says because I don't know if everyone who's listening would understand what he says. So I'm going to go ahead and play this clip okay. real, real quick here, and then uh, you can. After. At the conference, I told them I had made up this tale that all this came from millennia ago and, uh, from um, and that this information came from the Sufis. Yes. I told him that actually Oscar Richardson had not described any of the Enya types either. Actually, in the uh, uh, seven months we spent with him, he devoted about six hours to talk about the Enneagram, but he never came to describe any one of the types. That was all, Enrique, all that came from Enrique Chile. Enrique Chile, yeah. 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 So that yeah. came from my own observations, but mostly from automatic writing. It automatic came, writing? Yeah, it came to me through automatic writing. What did? Uh, the, the specific information and it's any types. Ab about any types, which yes. I then verified through observation, right. because and I was surrounded by people Right. I was teaching and exploring with. Okay, so okay, that yeah. was uh, that was our good friend Claudio Narano. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he, oh yeah. So he says in that interview that it didn't, it doesn't have ancient origins in the Sufi, and that they made right. that up, and that he received yep. the nine types through automatic writing. Can you explain that? 
Yes, exactly. Yes. And he is the first person who was teaching it with these personality types. He was the first person to do that. And so in that audio clip, he explained, first of all, he and Oscar Chaza just made up the idea that it was ancient. And they admit it's because, you know, it sounds better if you say it's ancient. (laughs) And that's definitely true for New Agers. If it's ancient, well, then there must be some wisdom to it. Uh, And he says, well, they just made that up. And uh, then he says he got these types, mostly, he said from his observations, but mostly via automatic writing. Automatic writing is a form of channeling. Uh, it's a form of spirit contact, and channeling is, spirit, channeling is a type of spirit contact. So what it is is that you open yourself up, usually by going into an altered state, which you can do through meditation, or you could do it with certain drugs. Mm-hmm. And, and, and Nahalanho did take drugs for spiritual purposes. Um, I watched another video of him where he talks about this, this trip he had with a psychedelic drug out in, out in the wilds of, uh, near Eureka, near the school. <laughs> and Oscar <laughs> Chazo, I think, sent him, <laughs> sent him out there to do this. Uh, and so uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's what he means by this, or that's how he did the automatic writing. But you can do it that way. Um, and that, then what you do is you open yourself up to this contact or to information. And then you, if you're writing with a pen or a pencil, then you just kind of let your hand go and you just write. And if you're really doing real automatic writing, you don't know what you're writing. You know, you're just writing. Your hand's moving and you're writing. Um, you, it can be done on a typewriter. It was done by... Um, Ruth Montgomery, who had been a Washington Post journalist, and uh, she had an experience where she started getting information, um, automatic writing, but it was on her typewriter. Huh. <laughs> uh, this was back in the 60s, I believe, um, and or maybe the 50s into the 60s or 70s. I read several of her books when I was in the New Age, and these were all, she would get information um, and, ty- you know, it would come through the typing. So, you know, and if you're channeling through your voice, then it comes through your voice. It's right. a different thing. But automatic writing is through writing. And so he says that's how he got the specific information or most of it. And it's a very crucial point. Now, is that really true? We don't know. Hmm. I I tend to believe it because of just who he is and what he believed. And he says elsewhere on that tape that, you know, higher... He, he even talks about Oscar Chazo said that he got information from his higher assault, from higher authority, hmm. a higher source. He uses both of those phrases, and what they mean is from another dimension. They mean right. from um, yeah. from entities on another dimension, which, of course, from my viewpoint and from a Christian viewpoint, would be spirit guides, right. like what I had. Now, spirit guides are fallen angels. Mm-hmm which I didn't say earlier. <laughs> and so uh, these these guides are very happy to pour out this information for humans to deceive you. And they're all it's all over the place. They're channeled books, uh, Neil Donald Walsh's Conversations with God, all of those yep. are channeled uh, where he supposedly gets answers from God. Um, a Course in Miracles was channeled. Oh, yeah. It really does happen. That I can have 100% uh I, I, you know, I can't say knowledge, but I 100% believe that that is that actually does happen. People really do channel the uh, teachings of the spirit. Mm-hmm. So I have no trouble believing Claudia Naranjo, especially since it's coming to this tool, which came <clears throat> straight out of, of a Gnostic New Age teacher, right. you know. So uh, I, and he said Echazo also got information. And one of the things I note in my writings on this is that Echazo uh, claimed to have contact with a, a angel named Metatron oh, and wow. another one called the Green Tube. <laughs> um, the Metatron actually is an angel named in the Kabbalah. Yeah, yep. yeah, I and recognize that. Just, yeah, in case anybody wonders, because I find a lot of confusion on the Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is not part of of biblical Judaism, <laughs> the Kabbalah, it's, it's not even, I've heard it called mystical Judaism, and in a way you could maybe say it is, but it's really a, an occult document from the Middle Ages that was claimed to be ancient, 
or maybe not a document, but several documents in writing yeah. that were claimed. They claimed they were ancient, but they weren't. I have an article on the Kabbalah on my website. Mm. So it's very interesting. He claimed this contact with Metatron. Now, then he also said they were states of consciousness. He said mm. they were states of consciousness. Yeah. But considering what he did and who he was or who he is, uh, he's still alive. I think he, it's not hard to believe he had spirit guides. Well, Carter and Aranjo is now teaching with these, these personality types that he says he got mostly, the automatic writing. And he's a very convincing man. I've watched several videos with him. He's, he's, he's very likable. I mean, as a person, I, I, I like him. I have no trouble liking him as a person. I think he would be interesting. I mean, now he's dead. I think he'd be an interesting guy to sit down and have a cup of coffee with. Okay. He's, yeah. he's very smart. Um, and he... Um, He's teaching us now, and the he also uh, one of the other people that learned it early on was Helen Palmer, who who at the time I think was calling herself a psychic, and she's a New Ager, and she learned the Enneagram early on, and because of her and her interest in it, and she wrote a book on it, it got into the New Age. So it had these two paths, one into the, the Je- to the Jesuits and one to the New Agers. And the New Agers, of course, this is a, this thing is like made for the New Age. Right. You know? yeah, it's, like, totally. it's like, here's a gift for you, New Agers. <laughs> the Enneagram is perfect for them because, yeah. why? Because it's built on a lot of, you know, tales, it has spirituality, and it's all about you. And it's about your divine self. Mm. So it's tailor-made for the New Age. No wonder it got snapped up in the New Age. And all these people started learning it, all these counselors and therapists in the New Age. And that's really big in the New Age because everything is all about you. So there's a lot of need for a lot of counselors (laughs) because everybody wants to know about themselves. So there's scores of New Age counselors that use the Enneagram. And um, there was one man in particular, Dr. David Daniels, who was really a clinical psychologist who learned it, interestingly enough, from Helen Palmer. Hmm. Now, there is no way you can listen to Helen Palmer talk and not realize she's spiritual in some sense. I mean, I can tell she's new age. Maybe not everybody could, but I have listened to her on YouTube. There's several things on YouTube of her talking sometimes about the Enneagram, sometimes about other things. You just have to listen for five minutes. I mean, it's very clear she's coming from a spiritual viewpoint that is not Christian. Mm -hmm. But yet he was willing to learn about this thing from her. So what I I read a little bit of some things he wrote. I, I, I don't know if I can say absolutely he was a new ager, but he was open to this kind of new age spirituality. Mm -hmm. And um, he and Helen Palmer taught, number of new agers because some of the new agers i've looked into say oh i i learned from dr daniels or i learned from helen palmer and dr daniels so they're responsible for teaching a lot of new agers i mean there are other people too but there are two of the big ones mm-hmm. he just dr daniels died i think uh in 2017 helen palmer's still alive um claudia naranjo died this year oscar chaz is still alive so now you have this this enneagram. That's that's what it really is. There is no objective base for the personality type. It didn't come out of psychological studies. It didn't right. come out of research. It didn't come out of a lot of uh, tests done at the universities. You know, on on personality or anything that's already out there on personalities. It just came from straight from Gurdjieff to Ichazo, to the New Age, to the church. And the the man most responsible for getting it into the evangelical church, not directly, but via the progressives, is Richard Rohr. Mm -hmm. And Richard Rohr um, is a Franciscan friar. He runs the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico. (laughs) And he... He learned the Enneagram early on, as I mentioned much earlier, when he was at that seminary and Bob Oaks came there. Mm -hmm. And so he started getting into it, and he and this man named Andrew 
Andres Ebert, who I think is German, because their first book was in, it was in German, was published in Germany mm. on the Enneagram. And then it was in 1989, I think, and then it was translated, and the most popular English book uh, or translation was 1991. And that's the book that got into the progressive church. The, um, I'm sure maybe there was a reprint after that, but the progressives, when the progressives got into it, and I can see why the progressives got into it, because Richard War is kind of a hero to the progressives because he has the label of Christian, and he talks about Jesus, right. uh, and he talks about social action and social justice, all the things that the progressives like. <laughs> so he's a big, a big influence and a, and a big hero to the progressive Christians. And so I completely understand why if, you know, they knew he, he had a book on the Enneagram or heard him talk about it, they would snap it up and they did. Right. Mm. Now, because of that, it, it, you know, he has students. Okay. And his students, two of his students, and actually these are not just students, these are people he mentored. Chris, Horitz, H-U-R-E-R-T-Z, who wrote the Sacred Enneagram is one of them. Suzanne Stabile, who co-authored The Road Back to You with Ann Cron, is another. Richard Rohr is their mentor. They mm. were mentored, uh, Suzanne Stabile says, for several years. She was mentored by Father Rohr, she calls him, I think. And they both admire him. Chris Horitz. Um, on a promotion for his book, uh, I saw, uh, and I've used, posted on this several times, he saying, uh, he says, you know, I'm grateful for my knowledge on the Enneagram came from my teachers, Richard War, and then he names three other people. And guess what? All three of these people are New Agers. <laughs> Shocker. <laughs> yeah. 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 And Suzanne Stabile, you know, and Ian Cron, uh, is an Episcopal priest. From what I've read about him, I would I would say there's a good chance he's a progressive. Yeah. Uh, I think Chris Hurts for sure is, and I think Suzanne Stabile is because of thing I've heard podcasts from them, and right. there's a lot of reasons why I think that I won't go into that. But right. all three of them teach at Richard War's Center in Albuquerque. Huh. They also so they associate with him too. They're yeah. They're his students, and they associate with him, and they teach there, and they brag about it. Even Zondervan, Zondervan, uh, on their promotion of Chris Hurt's book and a workbook, they just come out this month, or maybe about to come out, a workbook to go with the Sacred Enneagram. They talk about how he studied under Richard Rohr, so that's a good thing. Right. Okay, so I, people don't know why I'm saying that yet, but I'll, I'll get yeah. to that. Uh, people are probably like, well, what's wrong? What's wrong with Richard Rohr, you know? Okay, so should I go into that? Yeah, let's Please. let's do it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're timelining this through. I love your progression on this. This is good. Oh, good, good. I'm glad I'm making sense. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's hard. I know all this stuff, you know, and I want to put it in a sort of somewhat linear fashion so that, it, you know, it's it's progressing in a illogical manner. Oh, you're doing a great um, job. And, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Probably because I've had to write so much on it, and I have to, like, <laughs> think, you know, have to think about it. Okay, I need to make, you know, this needs to make sense to people. But thank you. So, um, Richard War. Uh, he came to my attention in twenty around 2013. I'd heard his name. I knew he was popular with the progressives. I knew he had the center. And I can't remember when I first found out that he had these uh, conferences. And I knew that he had had Buddhists come speak at his conferences. He had Marianne Williamson, <laughs> who's um, yeah. she's really new thought. But, you know, for sake of convenience, you can call her a new ager. But new thought is. New, the New Age incorporates the new thought. I don't know if she's a, a total New Ager. Like, I don't know if she believes in reincarnation or not. I'm right. not sure. But because not every, not new thought is, isn't is always pro-reincarnation. Uh -huh. But she she basically teaches, you know, affirmations and positive thinking and your thoughts will create your, your reality and all that. It's very new thought. So she, um, and she's a big fan of A Course in the Miracles. She's spoken there. And so when I found that out, I thought, well, what's up with this guy? Why does he have Buddhists there? And he's supposedly Roman Catholic, and he's having these 
and you know, there's a new ager and these Buddhists and these other people from other religions. Yeah. I didn't look into him a lot at the time because there wasn't a real reason to look into him. But then I came across, and I don't know why this happened or how, I came across a little video of him being interviewed by a priest on YouTube. And I think, well, I think it was the title caught me. It was, it was called The Cosmic Christ. Mm, now, yep. I knew uh, Matthew Fox wrote a book, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, which I've read, and I had warned people about Matthew Fox. Yep. Matthew Fox had been a Roman Catholic at one time. Eventually, the Catholics got him out of the Catholic Church, and he became an Episcopal priest in California. He had a, um, you know, he had this Wiccan priestess who was doing rituals <laughs> at his <laughs> I don't know if you want to call it a church or not, but whatever he called yeah, it. Yeah. And he was really out there, you know. And Matthew Fox actually is an influence in the New Age. A lot of New Agers like Matthew Fox, even though technically he's an Episcopal priest. Right. So the Cosmic Christ caught my attention because of Matthew Fox. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, why is he talking about the Cosmic Christ? So I listened to it. And there were things that he said that just made me... You know, I like had to go back and listen again because I thought Man, I, maybe I didn't hear him right. You know, because he was saying things like um, the first incarnation was at the Big Bang. And I yeah. thought, what is he talking about? And then he, you know, he went on and said some other things about the Christ and the cosmic Christ. And so I, I began to see he was making a distinction between Jesus and the Christ. But I wasn't totally clear on it, but I was clear enough that I wrote a warning post on him. My first warning post in 2013, and then after that, now and then, I would go back and, and look into him more as I heard more and more about him. Well, of course, then when the Enneagram became big, and I already knew his book had influenced the progressives, and I noticed that a lot of Christians, and I mean, you know, the evangelical, what you would assume to be conservative mm -hmm. or inconservative churches, were referring to Richard War or recommending his book. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I just, I mean, I wanted, you know, I wanted to be able to speak into my computer to the person and right. say, wait, stop. Yeah. Wait, why are you recommending Richard War? You know, don't you, don't you know about him? And I became really alarmed that he was getting a platform in the evangelical church through, in, through the Enneagram, at least in part. And there were other people speaking of him, too, outside of that. But that was one of the big ways he was getting in. And I've, hmm. I've come across it more and more since then. And so um, I was looking into Richard Rohr more. And I have read his latest book, uh, The Universal Christ. It came out in March. A kind person on Facebook had it sent to me. <laughs> I read it and wrote on it, I think, that month or maybe the next month, maybe April. and uh, Probably April. And so uh, that book, if you read my article on that, it's under book evaluations on my articles page, you will see some of the major problems of his theology. Basically, he's heretical on <laughs> almost every yeah. essential of the faith. Now, he will say, he will say he affirms the virgin birth, he affirms the deity of Christ, and he affirms the bodily resurrection. Okay, now those are three biggies. So people might hear that and think, well, okay, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that he thinks the first incarnation of Christ was creation. <laughs> that was the first incarnation. Okay. So Christ is creation already. Christ is in creation. So everybody is in Christ. We're yeah. all, in, and not just everybody, but the animals, the rocks, the rivers, the trees, everything is in Christ. Right. So right. everyone's in Christ. There's no need for salvation because we're already in Christ. And he takes Paul's um, phrase in Christ, and which he likes to point out, Paul uses, I think he says 37 times or something. And he says, well, Paul says that all the time. Paul was trying to show us the new paradigm of Christ. He was trying to teach us that. He got it. But for 2,000 years, the, the Western church just hasn't got it yet. Right. And so Richard Rohr is here to enlighten us on that point, basically. Well... So you've got this, every creation is Christ. Then you have, okay, then then Christ, and then Jesus Jesus is Christ. Okay, he'll admit that. Jesus, though, is almost kind of like this vehicle for the, the Christ, the mm -hmm. universal Christ. Right. And so when 
after the resurrection, then this universal Christ is sort of unleashed. And in, in Jesus, the universal Christ was able to take form. And that's what he said. He was able to take form. And, and he doesn't use the word unleashed, but that's the idea. So now the universal Christ can get out into creation and draw everything towards a point of perfection. And this is what he teaches. So he makes a distinction between Jesus and the universal Christ. And he says things like Jesus died, Christ arose. Uh, Christ said things Jesus would never say. Matthew, Mark, and Luke write about Jesus. John writes about Christ. Oh, wow. And he'll say things like that. So he's making very clear distinctions between Jesus and this universal Christ. And, uh, of course, I mean, that's a giant heresy. You know, that <laughs> to is, say the <laughs> least. <laughs> yeah, right, mean, yeah. to, say the, to say the least, you know. Um, and that's just one of them. I mean, he, you know, this idea of creation. Uh, so everything in creation is sacred because the Christ, God is in creation. And this is panentheism. Yep. And panentheism is not pantheism, God is all and all is God, but God right. is in all, all is in God. It's a little more subtle and not as easy to spot, but he, and he's an open panentheist. I mean, he uses the word, <laughs> uh, as does Matthew Fox, by the way. They both, they both use the word openly and they admit that that's their view and they think that it's a Christian view. If I could just stop you right so, there. So, uh, which... Okay. I was just going to say that I know uh, I've actually taken some classes with. Uh, it was weird. I had to take them for prerequisites, and they sounded interesting. So I know a little bit, and I've read some books on the New Age. But I mean that it basically sounds like what he did is he took e like these Eastern religion these the, these ideas of uh, I think is it Hindu that all is one and God is all and you know like these kind of things and just puts just slaps Jesus on it and all of a sudden expects everyone to go oh yeah that makes yeah, sense Yeah I mean he and is well he yeah he 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 does think Eastern religions have wisdom but not a I would say you know the Hindu view is more monist it's uh, right. more um pantheistic and this is panentheism yeah. You know, it's a little different because he doesn't say he, he doesn't say we don't have individuality in in, okay. in non-dual Hinduism. The view is that your individuality is an illusion, an illusion. Correct. And you yeah. have a divine self that eventually will merge with, you know, the ultimate reality, Cosmic the ultimate God or something. Yeah. And Buddhists say you don't have an actual self. There is no actual self. Now, so war doesn't teach either of those. Okay. So he, he got, but he does teach that we have, everybody has a divine spark and divine DNA, which I didn't say yet, but it's not along the same lines as Hinduism and Buddhism. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that distinction. I was just going to say that, I mean, red flags went up immediately, um, again, to say the least, but uh, it's just, that, yeah. that's, that's so insane that that gets passed off as Christian. And I was going to say, just as, um, it's very interesting the way that he, and just goes to show how insidious this is, that it gets taught in churches. And I'm sure there's people, yeah, maybe people that are legitimately saved that don't have enough discernment to, I was going to say, it, it's kind of yeah. like the occult um, Gnostic teaching is, you know, this is what, uh, you know, the, the whole Gnostic thing is, you know, there's a teaching Secret a, a knowledge. secret knowledge yeah. that gets passed on. Yeah. And they use a yeah. lot of these, uh, you know, Jesus said this, but he really means that, or, you know, the. Right. Uh, um, right. And, you know, how he quotes Paul and stuff like that is very insidious as, um, because to people that wouldn't know any better, you could, you might be able to look at that and go, oh, there's something there that, that, you know. Right. I can. I can jive with that. Like I, I, I well, a get lot that of it, right. yeah, and a lot of scriptures will, um, if they're taken out of context and taken wrongly, you could actually imply some of those things, like talking about God being in everything and holding, or like you know, God creating everything but being in it as well, and everything's in God. Uh, just Colossians in in the book of Colossians when it talks about Jesus creating everything it says he is before all things and in him all things hold together 
you know? And, and Yes, and in fact, yeah, Roar uses that. He uses that, and he uses, uh, I think it's Colossians 3.11, uh, in all, Christ is all, and in all. Right, And yeah. then, of course, that's talking about the supremacy of Christ. <laughs> right, right, not yeah. talking about him literally being in everything. But he uses those passages, and in fact, I he uses them in his book as well. And so I um, respond to two of those, uh, two passages that he uses like that. In my article on his book, I, I you know, say this is what he says it means, and then I write what it really means. Yeah. That's great. Because people don't know how to answer it. Yeah. They don't, they, they're like, well, yeah, I don't know how to say this is what, that he's wrong. Right. Yeah. So it's not even, it's not even, a tw- it's, it's heresy. It's outright heresy. This guy in Episcopal church, he's, you know, he's a wolf in, you know, sheep's clothing. Well, he's Catholic or Aurora's Catholic. Okay. Okay. Even better. <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> Matthew Fox is Episcopalian, is in the Episcopal oh, Church. Oh, Matthew, okay, so he so. was Catholic. Matthew Fox was Catholic. Right. He was kicked out of the Catholic Church at then, Catholic Church, and he's an Episcopalian. So he should change his name to Matthew Wolf, not Matthew Fox. He, <laughs> he's he, cunning oh, like well. a fox, though. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a little bit raw with that, but that's that's good. So, And I just want to say, point this out to anyone listening right now. We are going through the individuals that have had influence on not only the origins and creation, but promotion of this particular personality test called the Enneagram. Not any of them. Not any of them are are Orthodox Christians. No, I mean Roar is Catholic, but only in name. It seems like at this point. So, yeah. so I would yeah. I would say that consider the source and what's putting in front of you, and just pray for discernment. Like I, for me, I just this is the fr- most frustrating thing is that there was red flags as soon as I just saw the the weird looking pentagram looking logo of the enneagram to me, like. I almost was like, "Oh well, what is that? I don't need to mess with that. It looks <laughs> it looks something new age cultish or something." Yeah, you know. So, anyways, okay. but I appreciate the uh, the the aside because I, I just I think yes. it's so important, and this is why people listening, theology matters. Like it no, does. No, right? <laughs> read your Bible. Like, right. Go to a good Bible teaching church. Learn stuff. <laughs> but uh, I'm sorry for derailing it. I just I. I I think that was, it's super important to point out stuff like that and show the insidiousness. No, I, no, that's good. Yeah, and it's good to, to point out how um, those passages can be misused that you mentioned, like in Colossians, and, and Roar does that. And he, you know, what he's doing is he's, he's taking the meaning and taking it as a literal thing. And you have to read it in context. And, of course, other passages would disagree with that. Nothing in the Bible teaches that that Jesus Christ is in creation or part of creation. If he created, you know, and Colossians talks about through, you know, he was cr- created, uh, the world was created through him. You can't be part of what you create. I mean, you know, you're, you're I mean, I know New Agers believe that creation, some, some of them believe creation came out of God you know, sort of emanated from God. But really, logically speaking, that doesn't make any sense. And Christ can't be supreme over creation if he's a part of it. And so um, this has never been a historic Christian view. This is is not biblical. And um, he, he is misusing those verses and those words and misusing Paul's phrase in Christ, trying to support his view with it. And so that's one reason in my article on, on the book, I address two of those. Um, I address a couple of others, uh, a similar one, and a couple of others in another article I did on my website on Ann Vocamp's book, um, 1,000 Gifts, because mm. she also has panentheism in her book. Wow. Um, she doesn't use that word, but she has it in there. I don't think she deliberately, ha- I don't think she's aware of it, but it's definitely in there. The language is there, and it was in there enough to bother me and cause me to write about it. (laughs) So I address some verses in there that are used. I have a section on panentheism, and I address some of the verses that uh, are used by panentheists to try to support that view. Hmm. And so uh, that's also in that article. And so, you know, that's, that's right. People need to, you know, don't take somebody's word for it when they're using a verse and it's for a view you never heard of before or that sounds new or kind of strange or odd. 
you need to check it out. You know, read the context, read, you know, if you want, read commentaries on it, read, um, you know, just, you know, read it in context and think about what it's really saying. Mm -hmm. So that's talking about the supremacy of Christ. And, um, Anyway, I had read I read some good commentaries when I was writing that. I looked at what some common commentaries said, and now that most of us can get on the internet and we can, it's easy to find. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. You know, we can look up. A Bible Hub is a is a website I use a lot because mm-hmm, it yeah. has a section of commentaries on on any verse you want to look up, and it's it's That's very awesome. helpful. They don't always agree with each other, but you can get some you know basic ideas. Correct. So, um, so so this Enneagram thing now has reached these really incredible proportions in the church where people assume its validity. Yeah. And, and one of the problems is, is the, the fact that it has grown so fast and it's being used so widely makes it harder to expose it because the first reaction of a lot of people if they hear somebody say, well, you know, that's really not a good thing or it's really mm-hmm. invalid, yeah. their first action is, but there are all these books on it and all these pastors are teaching it or my right. pastor's teaching it. And you know, so their reaction is, well, you're, you're telling me all these people are wrong. <laughs> and see, they, they, so of course, they're skeptical because they're thinking, so you and a few other people out there say that you're right. And then all these other people... <laughs> Right. And yes, that's what I'm, that's exactly what I'm <laughs> saying. That's the nature. That is the nature of deception. That mm-hmm. is the nature. And and what I tell people who, you know, don't believe me at first, or, or, or I see on different threads where some of them tagged, uh, you know, and somebody's saying, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't believe her or something. I say, look, you know, just look at the facts for yourself. Right. Look that's at right. the facts. Is there historical evidence? that this was around in the fourth century. Where is the historical data? I don't mean what an Enneagram book says, because <laughs> what they're repeating, since those for two books I mentioned earlier were written by students of war, they're repeating what war said. Mm-hmm. And that's what he said. He said it came from the Desert Fathers. You know, he's the one who's tried to give it Christian origin. Um, and actually, there was an earlier book on the Enneagram, I guess before it really caught on, by Alice Freiling. F R Y L I N G, and I actually discussed her briefly in my very first article from 2011 because um, she had a website about the Enneagram, which is no longer. I can't find what I quoted from then. I can't find it now. Um, she wrote a book, and her husband at the time was like the um, he was like the publisher of IVP. He was like or the oh, head wow. of it or something. Okay. It's some big job. Yeah, and they published her book. She's a spiritual director. You'll find there's a lot of these people call themselves spiritual directors. <laughs> right. yeah. And she and she tried to claim that it was connected to Evagris Ponticus. Well, guess what? She also studied under war and teaches <laughs> at his center. Mm. So you tend to find all these strands of the Enneagram going back to war. Mm. Um, and then I this I absolutely do not want to forget to say this because people need to know this because I think probably ninety nine point nine percent of Christians do not know this. The fourth book, the fourth IVP book on the Enneagram called Spiritual Rhythms, they have a portion where they they um, acknowledge the contribution to the Enneagram teachings to a whole list of people. Hmm. Now, they mistakenly name <laughs> Vagris Ponticus. <laughs> wow. And I think they name Ramon, Ramon Lowell, which I'm like, oh my gosh, they're, they're, these people had nothing to do with it. You know, the, you know, they're dead, but I kind of feel sorry for them. Like they're being, <laughs> they're being tied to this fake thing. Then they name, they name Richard Rohr and they name, I counted, I looked up every person they mentioned because I, I knew some of the names, but most of them I didn't. 13 of them are new agers. Wow. Huh. Wow. They're just out and out New Agers, and, because and, guess what? Since the Enneagram was in the New Age longer, and mm-hmm. there's more of the books and the teachers of the Enneagram are New Age, guess who the Christians are learning it from? Just yep. like Chris Hurt, they're learning it from the New Agers. Mm-hmm. And there's another popular Enneagram teacher. I was asked about her all the time, and I just felt like I didn't have time to look into her, and I finally looked into her. Um, her name is Beth McCord. She has a business called Your Enneagram Coach, 
Hmm. And she calls herself an Enneagram coach. Um, and I finally found out, she said, oh, I've studied this extensively. I think she did for 15 years. And when I read that, I thought, okay, then who did she study it from? Because 15 years ago, the only people who really knew about it were the New right. And yeah. sure enough, she named six people, either six or seven people, I think six, who were her teachers. They're all New Agers. Yeah. And she claims to be a believer. Now, does she know that? I, do, I don't know. I don't know yeah. if she knows that or not. I'm, I'm tempted to think Christians are so... Unfortunately, some are so biblically illiterate or they're so ignorant of what the New Age is that they don't recognize it when it's right in front of them. Yep. And they can sit there and listen and learn from a New Ager and not even realize that person is New Age. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's crazy. I, I, I'm thinking that's got to be the possibility it is. because no, it if is. she knew, really knew what the New Age was, if she really knew what it was and could recognize that she would not want to learn from them. Right, right, right. And, and for, for our listeners, IVP, she keeps talking about IVP, that's InterVarsity Press. InterVarsity yeah, Press is a yeah. publishing group that focuses mainly on college-age people. Um, you've probably heard of InterVarsity, which is a—they were a ministry to colleges. Um, and yeah. So, and so they are looking to reach As, you know, a younger audience, a, a, you know, an up-and-coming audience as well. So that's important. And unfortunately, I, IVP of the university has um, has had workshops on the Enneagram. Of course. And yeah. I ran across a um, website of a woman who is in global leadership with university, and she teaches the Enneagram. So let me ask and you. And this was brought to the attention of somebody at. And in, in that ministry, and I don't know what actually is going to be done, though. Yeah, let me let me ask you a question, Marcia. So, what do you say to somebody? Because I've, I've I literally when I tried to share this information with somebody that is you know using the enneagram, loves it. Um, you know they they're just on you know they're just hot on it, and and the exact response I got was, "It's helped me in my marriage. It's helped me in my friendships. Yeah. It can't be that bad." Yeah. What is your response exactly. to someone like that? Oh, I have a, uh, yes, thanks for asking that. I do have a response because I have gotten that response and people have told me that's the response they get. Well, I told my friend about this and then she told me, you know, it helped her, you know. And so exactly what you said, that's a that's a very common response from people who have used it. Um, okay, here, there's a couple of reasons why you can feel something helped you, even if it's invalid. Uh, there's something called confirmation bias yeah. where you go into it thinking it will help you or wanting it to help you. And so you actually feel the information you're getting is helping you. The en- Enneagram can't tell you anything you don't already know because it's just a, an eight, a nine sided figure with numbers around it. Right. There's no, you know, there's no, it's like the magic eight cube or something, you know, it's, right. there's no, <laughs> there's not, it's even less than that. But Mar- like but I said Marcia, much earlier, it's, it's contents are empty. I'm a seven though. You can't I'm, say that. I'm a seven. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I'm telling you, you can see, you can, so we so want to identify with something we'd like to classify or most, a lot of people like to classify themselves. A certain way. That's why um, Zodiac signs are so popular. Right. And I have had Christians ask me, you know, I know astrology is wrong. I know it's not Christian, but why, why does this Gemini sign fit me so well? Now, and here's what I want to say about people who say it helps you. There's a confirmation bias. There's something called the Barnum syndrome, which I have to read about again because I can't remember. <laughs> but it's something it's used. It's used. It, it goes into effect when you're reading about yourself. You tend to, you accept what's being Identify said. Identify with it. Um, I need to double check on that, but I have to, I have to look at it. Um, but here's the other thing I tell people, and I told people this, and because it was an astrologer, I know this. Um, all of my clients over the years, uh, and everyone I know connected to astrology say it works. And all of my, my clients told me that it helped them. And some of them told me that I helped them more than their therapist. Hmm. I actually had clients who said, you've helped me. You've told me, you know more about me than my therapist just from doing my charts. Okay. So I tell people if millions of people around the world or they think there's, they fit their Zodiac sign or their birth chart is accurate. But yeah, is are you going to say that astrology must be valid because of that? Well, a Christian yeah. is not is going to say, well, no, I'm not going to say astrology. I hope 
They're going right. to say, no, astrology is not valid. Now, that's not evidence that astrology is valid. That's evidence that you think it's valid. Yeah. It's yeah. the same. The Enneagram works exactly the same way. It's exactly, I feel like I really understand it because it, there's really a lot of similarities to astrology with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the basic philosophy behind it is different, but the way it works is very similar to astrology. And it's so easy to get people to believe this. All you have to do is make them think it's valid and then say, all right, now you just need to figure out your, your number here or your numbers and your wing and all this. And then we're going to give you, you know, all this information will be given to you based on these types and based on where you are in the Enneagram and how you relate to their numbers. And, you know, and people, and what happens is people start seeing themselves through that filter. They start seeing themselves as an eight or as a four or whatever (laughs) it is. And they start thinking, they start thinking that way. And when they do or think things that conform to that type, they think, well, see, that validates it for them. Yep. It's like, it's like, yep, see, that's exactly what, how a four would, would react. And that's how I react to that. And they, and it starts becoming true because you start noticing all the things about it that match you. You disregard the things that don't, or you actually maybe even start getting shaped by it, mm-hmm. which is yeah. really scary. Cause I mean, that can happen in astrology. And I think it can happen. This is, I think, one of the big dangers. Um, another big danger of it is that it is being taught now by most Christians, not just as a personality thing, but as a way to be more like Christ, as a way to grow as a Christian. It's taught okay. as a discipleship. Okay, thing. Per- this is and a great. That's what really scares me. So this is a great second question. Then, like, what do you say to the person who says, "Well, God can use anything for good"? I mean, you know, like He's using it, so it can't be that bad. Is it like? Yeah, well, my yeah. Well, first, I I would I would challenge that statement. Would would God use? I mean, maybe in an extreme case, would God use an astrology chart for good? Right. Maybe to draw the maybe to get the person to see it's wrong or evil. Maybe <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> you know, would God would God use uh, tarot cards? Would God use um, um, sorcery? No, God, and God never uses something he forbids. I've had people, mm-hmm. you know, people, of course, have asked me about the Magi a lot because I was an astrologer. God used the Magi, but he didn't use astrology. Right, right. And he didn't, and he doesn't, and, and it, he denounces astrology. You know, yeah. he, God doesn't contradict himself. So, yeah, God can use, I would, I would prefer to say God can use anyone. But I don't really think God, God doesn't use things that are evil and he doesn't use things that he condemns uh, unless he's going to use it as a judgment on people. Um, I think a really good example of this is when Saul went to the medium at Endor because he was desperate for advice from Samuel, who was dead. And the medium, you know, does her thing and then she's shocked. She cries out <laughs> yeah, because right. yeah. Samuel really appears. And it I believe works. it's Samuel because the, the Bible says it's Samuel. And um, and I think she, maybe she, she didn't see what she normally saw. And right. so um, whatever, you know, uh, I, there are different reasons she could have cried out. But I think the main reason is, is that God brought Samuel to Saul. Right. You right. know, he didn't use, he didn't need a medium to get Samuel, you know, (laughs) I mean, God doesn't need a medium for anything and he's not going to use a medium. Hmm. He himself brought Samuel up because Samuel rebuked Saul and then tells him he and his sons are going to die in battle the next day. Um, This was a judgment on Saul. You know, it's like God was saying, okay, so you wanted to contact Samuel and you're willing to go to a medium, which I have forbidden. And in fact, Saul had forbidden. He had, said get rid of all the mediums in the land and but yet he knew there was a few out there and his men found this one yeah, this woman right. well god's saying okay so you're willing to go to a medium which you know is wrong because you're so desperate for samuel well guess what i'm going to give you samuel but you're not going to like what he says you know you're you're you think you're going to get help right. what you're going to get is judgment and that's exactly what he got in first chronicles ten thirteen says one of the reasons God had Samuel killed was because he consulted the medium. 
So God took that very seriously. So in that sense, God used that scenario, although he didn't actually use the medium. Yeah. But God can take a situation. I think God can use any situation in any person. Does he use an occult tool? Yeah. No. Right. No, he does not do that. That well, would be against his nature because well, he's righteous. He doesn't do evil. Yeah, and, and I just would add to that, too, that you know when you, you, you talk about the, the Enneagram, how all these things are already known. It's not as though it's something that God's revealing, you know, <laughs> it's already known about your personality. It's already known these things about you. And it doesn't mean that yeah. it's God. And there's other things. And it's, you know, S- Satan's old trick, right? He doesn't tell you an outright lie. He tells you partial truth. And so. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So there's truth mixed in and the best, best deception has truth mixed in it. That's yeah. right. And, um. This also, this is rather than focusing on God, it's focusing on self. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And and it's not even a legitimate focus on self. It's an invalid thing <laughs> that's not legitimate. And to say that this is a way to know God, in me, to me, is almost blasphemous. I mean, the way mm-hmm. we know God is God's word, and yeah. God's word is sufficient. God's word is sufficient for rebuking for training, you know, for all purposes and growing That's right. um, in Christ, it's God's word is sufficient. And our focus, and what does the Bible do? It doesn't focus on us except as we need things in order to to be disciplined and to be aware of where we need to grow. Yeah. Um, it focuses on Christ, and that's how we grow. We grow by focusing on Christ, not by focusing on ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so the Enneagram, in my mind, is to- has it totally backwards. But it's what is our default nature as humans is to be interested in ourselves. And that's <laughs> one reason I think it's catching on the way it is. Man, you just made and, me think of something amazing. You, you, you were talking about how the people are using this as a discipleship tool to find Christ. Yes. And it's like, how do you find Christ by looking within yourself? You can't. You yes. can't. You can only find him by looking outside of yourself into something else, the, the another living being, God. <laughs> so Exactly. And yet people are talking about, you know, like Suzanne Stabile quotes Richard Rohr, who says, the Enneagram is the face of God. Oof, man, that's not... <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's horrible. And I've... And I've heard about, and I've also heard, seen um, some articles about how it's the Enneagram is the nine types that are all summed up in Christ. Wow. I've heard that And I I've mean, they're, they're too, trying to yeah. attach God and Jesus to the Enneagram to make it seem more Christian. Yeah. yeah. And validate this is very, it. very contrived. Yeah, to validate it. It's very contrived. It's not, um, you know, to me, it's, it's just uh, repulses me to hear things yeah. like that. Yeah. But apparently for some people, they think it sounds like a good idea. And they're also taking it and using them biblical characters, you know, like, oh, Ruth was a <laughs> two or, you uh, know, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Gideon was an eight or whatever, you know, and they're coming up with it. And I'm, I'm thinking, my goodness, instead of reading the Bible and studying God's word and, yeah. And memorizing scripture and 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 witnessing, using it to witness and and try to uh, grow. We're going around trying to find the enneagram number for biblical <laughs> characters. Yeah, that's you right. You know, it it, right. it, 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 it it's distracting. It takes up unnecessary time. It's invalid. The focus is on self. It's going to cause people to look through themselves through the filter of their number. It's going to take away. Mm-hmm their attention from Christ. It's going to do exactly the opposite. Yeah. And yeah. I think we're going to see fallout from this. I've had different ideas on um, why God has allowed this to happen. I've wondered, is this happening because it's going to take people away who do not truly love Christ? It's going to, it's going to expose them Yeah, because uh, you know, already, I mean, I have to wonder about the people who wrote the Enneagram books who are students of Richard War because he's so heretical. Right. And ha- if they were mentored by him, how could they possibly not know his views? Yeah. He's very right. open about his views. I mean, it's not hard to find his views. The website, um, cac.org, it's huge. All, it has a search box. You could go in there and put atonement. And you can find all these blogs Richard War has written on the atonement, which are all heretical. He doesn't believe <laughs> wow. that Jesus died for sin. 
he doesn't believe, he, he doesn't think, he thinks that God had Jesus died to show solidarity with, with humanity, and because reality has a cruciform shape. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and because the Roman Empire didn't like Jesus. N- nothing right. of, nothing about taking on the sins of the world <laughs> and, you know. No, oh no, he does well he doesn't think sin is a problem right. because sin is not the main problem. The main problem is that we need to realize we're already in Christ and he taught <laughs> he's he's also a follower um of Carl Jung. Yeah. So he talks a lot about the shadow self and right. you know, learning the shad learning the shadow self and a lot of his followers do too and of course a lot of new agers um are union they're yeah. fans of uh i mean we use union young uh union ideas are used in astrology oh really right. so i'm very familiar hmm. oh yeah i'm very familiar with the union idea because Jung himself liked to impose his ideas of the archetypes on the planet yeah and uh the zodiac signs and he linked them up and that got into astrology because a lot of um actually some of the books i read on astrology were by union psychologists hmm. Hmm. who wow. were also astrologers so i'm very familiar with that kind of thinking i and i recognize it and i could see it in roar and sure enough you know i got it i had it confirmed yeah um so i have a, a big big ball of just <laughs> just like you know it's like when you sweep up a, a dirty room where there's broken glass and and there's uh lint and there's dust and there's pieces of paper and there's cardboard and you all sweep it up into a big ball in the middle you know mm-hmm. i mean that's the enneagram <laughs> it's just it's debris it's debris <laughs> from gurdjieff it's debris from ichazo from naranjo from richard Wolver from all the new age stuff that got put into it. You can make the Enneagram say anything you want it to. You know, I like to ask people like, well, what do you, what is the standard for the Enneagram? What do you go to to see if you're right about That's it? Right. That's if right. If someone's yeah. teaching it, if someone's teaching it, who, where's the model Enneagram that you go by? Well, there isn't one. Huh. There isn't one. There's so many varieties of it. Right. Because the, the new age loves variety. Right. Yeah. So, you know, you can't, you don't have a standard one. Now, if you want to use Richard War as a standard, well, then you're in even deeper trouble because when you look at what he believes, yeah, <laughs> it's right. not, right. not going to, it's not going to validate anything he says. Yeah. So. Well, I, I tell you, it's really. just, it's just apparent to me that there's a, a tremendous lack of discernment in the, in the current church today. Uh, in, yeah. in, in particular, uh, the ev- evangelical churches are drifting, yeah. you know, and we know this came in through the seeker sensitive movement and other other you know things that we permitted, that they permitted, and uh, it's it's created a loss of discernment because of the desire for attraction. Hmm. So I'm not going to make a big deal over something like this because. You know, I don't want to put a stumbling block in front of someone trying to come into Christ, and so um, right. But the the reality of that thought is that Jesus. I mean, Paul said himself, "I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's yeah. the power of God unto man, for man unto salvation." When you proclaim the gospel right. clearly and lovingly and plainly, it, there's power in that. The Holy Spirit moves in that and moves and convicts hearts and yeah. re- regenerates man you know, by faith when they receive it. So I think if we can return to those things, talk about moving back to ancient ways, let's turn back <laughs> to the ancient ways of just proclaiming the gospel exactly. and love. Real ancient. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and, exactly. I mean, I believe, I, I totally agree with you. The, 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 what saves people, what God uses to reach people is the gospel. Yeah. And that, you know, that's what he told us to use. Use the gospel, use his word. That's where the power of, of salvation, that's, and it's God's power, it's not our power. Mm-hmm. And using all these things to try to appeal to people, and I actually had it one pastor, after I told him about the Enneagram, he wrote me back and said, well, you know, I want to reach people, and I'm just going to use this as a tool to reach people. Wow. And I'm thinking, you know, did he not read what I said? Right. I mean, you don't use... I, you know, you don't, and I even quoted the verse of, uh, from Romans there, Romans, what was one seventeen, I think, or something, one sixteen. Yeah. that, you know, you the, the gospel is the power unto salvation. And, you know, I said, you don't use an invalid 
false tool from the new age to reach. That's not how you reach people. Right. right. That's right. It's going to backfire on you, you know? Yeah, that's right. So we oh, need man. to pray for the church and yes. for people who have been caught up in this. Now, I want to say on a, on a positive note, several people have told me that they were into it. And when they saw the information, some of it coming from me or post, you know, it was posted by other people from my, my sources. And there's a few other people out there speaking out. They, they, they said, I, I realized it's totally hogwash and I'm not doing this anymore. And in fact, they were starting to warn people. So there are awesome. some people who, um, even though they thought it was okay. And even though they did it, have 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 turned around from it and said mm-hmm. I'm not using that anymore I'm not you know and I'm going to warn people and there's two churches I know of that one church once they got the information they had planned a seminar on it and they they completely canceled it wow That's and yeah. somebody told me about another church that also canceled good for so, them so you know there's there's a little bits of of, of of glitter in the darkness <laughs> or there's uh well you know we're not in darkness we're children of light yeah but the enneagram is, is definitely to me is not part of that light no. and so uh, we need to shine the light of god's truth on it and then those who want to see it will see it yeah Amen. and um that's you know that's the best we can do we can pray and we can give people the information and love. And as you said at the beginning, we're not doing this program to make anybody feel guilty or feel bad, probably because in most cases, people don't didn't have this information. Right. And they were given wrong information. And so now, you know, now they have the facts. They can rethink it. Yeah. Well, I, Marsha, I just want to tell you how appreciative I am of your efforts and your research and your discernment. I mean, the fact that, this was on your radar all the way back in 2011, I think you said, or 2009, whenever your yeah. first article yeah. was. Uh, yeah. The fact, yeah. you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to, yes. to work yes. out these things and, and research the facts because that they do matter in something like this. Yeah. And um, and I just want to, you know, say thank you to you. You're, you're a blessing and a, and man, I, I, I don't want to speak for Rosie, but we would love to pick your brain on other occasions. We're doing this whole month of November. We're calling it New Age November uh, from the podcast. Oh. <laughs> so this was the kickoff oh, for it. Okay. So Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, sure. Yeah, I I could. There are other topics I could speak on, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling you would. <laughs> but uh, uh, Yeah, I definitely, yep. Yep, I could do that. So, but uh, anytime you want to come on to the podcast, we just want to extend an open invitation to you if you have something yeah. that you want to share or that you feel like you know our listeners would benefit from. We totally want to want you to know that. And um, well, and, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, and I can't say anything better. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> yeah. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you so. Well, thank so much. you for having me on. Yeah, so absolutely. we could share this information with people. Yeah, and yeah. everybody needs to go to christiananswersforthenewage.org. That's christiananswersforthenewage.org. And you can find all of her information, a plethora of information there. She's got tons of articles, and you will not be disappointed. And hey, I would just say educate yourself. Get in mm-hmm. there and learn the truth. Yeah. So not only you can defend right. the truth, but you can also live within it. So, man, well, thank you again, Marsha. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Turner and Rosie. I really enjoyed it, and thank you for giving me all that time. Absolutely. You're awesome. We'll, we'll have you <laughs> back again soon, okay? Okay, yes. That would be great. All righty. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the All Out War podcast today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to know more, you can visit us on the web at alloutwar.us, or you can find us on Twitter at AllOutWarCast. Hey, thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time.